and then pray for Brother Rick Nelson. He uh, was taking some of the hills uh, a little while this uh, this week and the latter part of the last week. And in fact, he came home a minute a moment ago. In fact, we took some food down to him and they pulled in the driveway right ahead of me and uh, they was bringing him home then. So pray for Brother Rick. It's just a sad situation there. Just, mm. Fresh my heart. Good man. Good man. Love the Lord. Still does love the Lord. It's just so sad to see him get the condition that he's in. But uh, I'm glad God says his grace is sufficient. Amen. I want you to pray for his wife and family. It's difficult and hard on them. It's getting to the point, place that Miss Faith just can't take care of him. And that's, that's breaking her heart. So pray for her. And then on the, on the good note, on the good note, Brother Marvin's got something he wants to share with us. I just hate to be able to look full of where I can share it with everyone at one time. But I promised him if he'd take care of this, that I would take him just shot it from the mountaintop and just praise his precious name. Don't know where it be new, but about a year ago I had a biopsy done and it came back positive for cancer. Well, a couple, three weeks ago, I had another one. call them out, and they all come back negative. No chapter 11, verse 24. If y'all know what he's talking about there, that anything that you have desired whatsoever, believe that you've received them, and ye shall have them, and he bless me. Amen, brother. That's a blessing, isn't it? God's still in the healing business. God still answers prayer. Amen. Well, we had a good time here Sunday night. Amen. What a blessing. It's good to see three of those that got saved on Sunday night here in the Lord's house tonight. Praise the Lord. That's a total of four. And uh, thank God for it. I really do. Amen. Praise the Lord for those that came. Praise the Lord for those that prayed. Praise the Lord for the good time that we had. And I'm glad we can still rejoice over that. Okay? All right, let's stand and, and let you have a prayer request that I can pray with your hand. And God knows all about those. And just stand if you would, and we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer. Brother Buddy, come and lead us in a song. And then we'll get right to each man and let them get started uh, tonight and share with us what the Lord laid upon their hearts. That's, that's God's blessing. Brother Dwayne, would you pray for us, please? Our dear Lord and Savior, we humbly come before you now, Lord, and we just thank you for a day through this week that we can come to your yes. house and worship you. Lord, we just thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, Lord. Yes, we just ask you to show up here tonight, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. Lord, touch each and every one here. Be with these missionaries, Lord, and just touch them and use them. Lord, we just thank you for the work you did here Sunday night. Lord, it wasn't us. Praise your name. Lord, you touched them and you worked. And Lord, when you decide to do what you want to do, Lord, it works. And Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we just ask you to have your willing way here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Remain standing and turn your hymnal to hymn number 74, Saved by the Blood. We'll sing the first and the last verse. Amen.
blood tonight. Amen. That is still the blood that saves from sin, changes us and forgives us and washes us white as snow. Let's have the ushers to come forward to receive the evening offering. And while they're coming, I will take time to make a couple of announcements. Um, don't forget, uh, in the morning, uh, those of you that are veterans that are going up to uh, Strawberry Hill with us to eat breakfast in the morning, the church is going to take you out and uh, buy you breakfast for you in the morning and in honor and thank you for serving our country. And I think we have about, um, about 12, I think, that's going, the veterans. And, and if anybody else wants to go, we've got room for about three or four more if you want to go in the morning for breakfast. Now, you have to buy your own. The church is going to buy the veterans breakfast in the morning, but if you'd like to go with us, we got room for about three or four more if you would like to go and ride on the bus. So uh, just let me know uh, after the service uh, if you want to go, and we'll put you down, and we've already made reservations, so we've got, we've got space for you, okay? So go if you can. We'd like for you to go with those of you that are able to go. So, And then... Uh, these are the one of the shoe boxes that is going to be sent to Mexico. And if you're in question about how they are to be wrapped, you can look at this one. All the contents are inside. Uh, the lid and the box container are wrapped separately. So in case when they go through the border there, they open them up to see what's in them. They don't have to rip the packages. It's got rubber bands on it. Rubber bands and the boxes are back in the, in the lobby. And uh, ever have any children you're buying for, you get that many boxes, you get two rubber bands for each box. Wrap it this way. If you have a question, you can come up here and open this one and look at it. Uh, but you just wrap the lid separate and the bottom separate and put the lid back on with the rubber bands to hold it, okay? So we got, I think we have all the Mexico uh, children taken care of, but now we have uh, also back there the box uh, names for the children at the Tabernacles Children home over in Greenville. And I think there's 34 names. Uh, I can't remember something like that. Okay, that's 34, I think. Something like that. 30, 40. But anyway. Uh, I'm not sure I talked to him yet, but it should be about the third, second week in December. We have to take them up to Waynesville usually. So the ones at Greenville, we can take, you know, ourselves over there. But if you could help us with those uh, children, also at Tabernacle Children Home over there, that'd be a real blessing. That's what we did yeah, last year. We took about 40 from Mexico and somewhere around 40 for Tabernacle, and that gave us a total of 80 boxes. So you've done real well in taking care of those going to Mexico real quick. So if you could help us out with those others, and just put the same thing you put the ones going to Mexico, you can put the same thing the ones going over to Tabernacle here in Greenville. Okay? Yeah, well, these supposed to be labeled, too. Yeah. yeah, all of them have names on them. Be sure to put the names on them, okay? All right, let's ask the Lord's blessing tonight to be upon the uh, offering and also upon these prayer requests of the hands that were raised. Brother Herschel, would you pray for us, please, brother? Father, we do want to pray for you, once again. Yes. Yes, Doc. Yes, God, great. Yes, play with it. Yep. Father, we pray in this offering. Yes. Father, you are given to the people you have ever sent. Granted, Jesus. Yes. Yes. Yeah, bless the Lord. Help them use them. Lord, we pray. Eternal. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Brother Herschel.
Ladies and gentlemen, we'll let jug up for Jesus. Amen. I, all that comes into that jug, it goes to the mission field, by the way. Uh, missionaries, we're glad we have a part in doing that. It's such a blessing. They call it, sometimes they call it the hug jug. That's all right with me. Amen. All right. Well, I know Mason has got to count his. I like, well, you count money. I want you to count money. <laughs> Is there 20 in there? Wow. So, how many hugs do I get? Well, Excel. <laughs> Come into a good warm building and looking for God to warm our hearts here tonight in this service. We have Brother Andrew Smith will come first uh, tonight and share with us his burden and what the Lord laid upon his heart. He'll introduce his wife and um, he, I told him he could do what he wanted to. I don't think he could do it in 30 minutes. Come on, brother. Sorry to put a time limit on somebody, but you know how some of these uh, Baptists are. I'm not, I'm not necessarily missionaries. I'm talking about. Baptists in general, they'll take a little bit more than they're supposed to. Sure, it's good to have you tonight. You and your wife. That's your water if you need, brother. Thank you. Um, I guess we're going to show a video first. So. You going to do the video? I remember it was about 4.30 in the morning. I got up really early, and I went to the kitchen, and I looked outside at the, the apartment complex across from ours, and I saw this man in his living room, and he was worshiping his idol. I saw him. He was standing there. He had his hands raised into the air, and then he would fall down to his knees and then prostrate himself before his idol. This man was looking for something from his idol. He was looking for fulfillment in his idol. It was a Sunday. Uh, I remember Lily and I decided we wanted to go to visit a church. Uh, it was in the center of the city, one of the biggest cities in, in China, in Shanghai, 25 million people. And we went into this church and I sat and I listened to the message. And the message that I heard that day was that if you want to have a right relationship with God, you have to do all these good works. And I just walked out of that place shaking my head thinking, what did I just hear? All of these people are coming from all parts of the city to, to hear a message that cannot save, that cannot satisfy, that is gonna leave people thirsty again. When I was teaching in the university, there was this young man who would come every week after class and he, he, he would ask me if he could walk with me and just ask questions. And so of course I was willing. And the questions that he would ask were about politics and uh, religion and about evolution and philosophy and all these questions about life. He was looking for answers. And I just remember every question he would ask, the only answer that I could give him was that we need Jesus, that he is the only solution to man's problem. China is a huge country, 1.4 billion people. And a mass majority of those people are stuck in lies Buddhism, atheism, and false religion, things that cannot satisfy, the water that leaves men thirsty. We are Andy and Lily Smith, church planting missionaries to China. We want to take to the Chinese the message of salvation, the message that can satisfy the soul. Now Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And Jesus said to the woman at the well, If thou knewest the gift of God, thou wouldest have asked of him. 
how can they ask of him if they don't know? Please consider supporting us so that we can go back and give the gospel to the Chinese. Wada 但是我觉得我不需要去那个地方去了解耶稣是谁 我觉得我活在这个世界上很痛苦 十月五号的那一天，我感觉我快要死了。啊，我感觉我的浑身在发抖，我感觉我的灵灵魂要从我的身体里面出来的时候，我的姑姑啊，看到了我，看到我的一个精神状况非常的不好。啊，我姑姑
uh, my mom, she said, Andy, come with me. And so we got in the car, and she was driving, and she said, Andy, I don't care what she thinks about me. I'm gonna tell, I need to tell her about Jesus. And so my mom, she was driving to her friend's house to give her some gospel tracts and to share the gospel. And that made a big impression upon me. And my mother, I watched that woman. Uh, she became a believer when I, was, when I was born. And you know, I can stand up here and smile, and you think, man, Andy's a happy guy. But you know what? You don't know that. You really don't know that. You'd have to watch me for a long time to really know what's going on, on inside of me. And, you know, I watched my mom. I saw her every day. And there was something real about the joy that was in her heart. And she was not a perfect person. She, was, she had her imperfections, but through that imperfect person, God used her to show me a perfect God who she trusted. And so what a, what, uh, what a huge impact a mother or a parent has on their child. So I am a result of that. I heard a lot of preaching in my days, but my mom was the one who sowed the seed. Uh, when we got into high school, um, our family church hopped to a church. Uh, we went to this church, and this pastor would open up the Bible every week and do something rather dangerous. He would preach the gospel. And you know, the gospel is dangerous. Um, it can pierce through a heart. Um, it doesn't just change your life. Uh, join the army, that'll change your life. Get a new job. I mean, take drugs, that'll, take, that, that'll change something, right? But the gospel brings new life. And I know at that time when I heard, I believed, I know that I know that I believe, because there was a difference. There was a change in my heart. My relationship with sin was different. Uh, I didn't see it as something I wanted to do anymore. I didn't see it as normal. And God put a new desire in my heart. I wanted to serve Him. I mean, I think every, every believer who has the Spirit in their heart wants to do something for God. Right? I mean, His Spirit is in your heart. You want to, He's your Father. You want to please your Father. But you know, there's an enemy who does not want us to believe and does not want us to serve. And I tell you what, when I became a believer at that time, I went through the darkest period of my life. And it was just a struggle. And you know, some people say, I got saved and everything's been great ever since. <laughs> Not me. Yeah. When I got saved, I just went through with such a doubt, struggling with doubt, thinking maybe, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe my faith isn't real. You know, how could God forgive me of all the things that I thought, said, and did? How could he forgive that? And you know, the, the enemy can build a great case. I mean, he is, he is the master case builder against us. I mean, he, he can build a case so great that any righteous judge must condemn. But you know what? We have an advocate. He takes that, he takes that list and says, pay for, pay, 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 pay. pay. And I am so thankful for that. I remember one day I was driving in the car, and God gave me a Bible verse. It was a verse that I knew when I was a little boy. But you know what? It was that day that I believed that verse. And it was, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and it was at that moment I realized something. I wasn't believing God's word. I knew that verse. I mean, it was just as simple as just simply knowing, hearing the promise and believing his word. And that changed everything. I mean, how can you, how can you serve God if you're, how can you invest everything in heaven if you don't even know if God wants you there? I mean, you just can't. I, I couldn't tell people about Jesus. I didn't even know if I was going to heaven. But you know what? There was a point where I said, I need to start believing God. Don't call him a liar. Lord, you said it. Right. You know, I wasn't. I need to walk by faith, not by feelings. I don't feel like a Christian. I look in the mirror today, I'm like, that's a Christian? That's a bad example. <laughs> Feeling is not faith. But God's word is true. He is true. His character is true. And that is faith. Believing his word and then walking according to it. And what a great lesson to learn. And that changed everything. My heart was set free. God, I can serve you now because it is your good pleasure to give me the kingdom. That's what the Lord said, right? He's talking about investing in the kingdom. All you have, put it up there. God wants you to be there. I mean, Jesus came to this world so you could be there. We need to start believing God's Amen. promises. I think everybody in this building probably has something in their mind. Maybe a worry, maybe some discouragement. I tell you what, the promises of God are a quick path to joy. The problem is that the enemy gets in there and he starts messing things up. Thank you. Praise God for the promises. That's our business. Our business should be to search those promises and be believing those promises. When I got uh, was working my first job um, out of college, 
I was miserable. And I thank God that I was miserable because God didn't want me to stay there. And I remember saying, God, I want to serve you. I want to do something for you. And I said, God, if you want me to go to China, send me to China. And, well, you can kind of guess the result there. Uh, God pulled out the slingshot, put me in there, and, went, and I went to China. It was like a, two years later, I was in China. Uh, I went back, I quit my job. I say I fired my boss. No. Um, I quit my job, I went back to school, started studying Chinese. There was a scholarship that nobody applied for. So I applied, and I got it, yay. And I look back, and I say, God, you answered that prayer. You answered that prayer. I can think back to times in my life where God, he answered my prayer. I said, God, train me for ministry. Lord, I want to serve you. Give me, I want somebody to teach me how to serve. Now I look back here now, I am at Vision, uh, preparing to be a missionary. And God, you answered that prayer. You know, we need to be asking God for things. You know, we need to be bold prayers, too. You know, remember Moses? He's a good example. God, I want to see your face. That's a pretty bold request. God said, oh, a little bit. Someday, God is going to answer that prayer. I mean, we're going to see him face to face. We need to be thinking about what is the biggest prayer you know God's going to answer. We need to ask those prayers. We need to be seeking God. He gave us a promise. He will answer it if we ask according to his will. When I got to China, and, you know, before I went to China, I was not a very bold guy. But when I got there, guess what happened? Absolutely not. I was still that same guy. I mean, get up in the plane, you go over, come down. I mean, how much different can you be, right? And I got to China. I spent about six years in China. As a I was there for two years as a student, 12 years as a teacher, and about six years in as a teacher. You know, I wasn't doing anything for the Lord. There was, there was a fear. Whenever you go to China, there's a fear. It's just, there's an atmosphere of fear. Foreigners in China will tell you, do, you cannot do that in China. You can't share the gospel. If you're a teacher, you dare not say anything in, in the classroom. Otherwise, you'll get, you'll get fired, you'll get kicked out. And it's like 007 Christian. It's like nobody would even know. You know, put your Bible on the table. And if a student opens it up and points to John 3.16 and says, what does that mean? Then you can teach him a secret handshake. And then bring him into the, whatever. I mean, it's ridiculous, the mentality. You know, the Bible doesn't teach us that mentality of Christian. The Bible doesn't teach us a 007 secret Christian lifestyle. I mean, those who saw the risen Lord, how did they act? They were bold. They were out proclaiming the message. There was something greater than self-preservation. There was one who was greater. And to suffer for his name was greater than to preserve oneself. You know, in Philippians chapter 1, verse uh, 29, it says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. It is given to you. Happy birthday. Yes. It's a gift. Amen. It is a treasure. That you may suffer for his name. That tells me how great he is. Right. I think that's the key. If we want to live a life of obedience, we need to have our eyes fixed on the greatness of who we serve. I had a friend who had a piece of trash, found that piece of trash and put it up on the shelf as a treasure. And I'm like, why? That's trash. You know why? Because it had the initials of a famous athlete. And she was like, oh, guess who used it? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, how did that trash become treasure? It had everything to do with the person who used it. Yeah. I tell you what, persecution is not something I want. But when it is done for Christ, when, it, when it's connected with his name, it becomes a treasure. I think that's the attitude. If we can have that attitude, uh, we've conquered life pretty much, right? If suffering becomes a joy, what is there left to, to, to put us discouraged on, right? And so, so uh, in China, I, I started out in the, uh, just fellowshipping with the underground churches. I got connected with them, and that was a great experience. Those believers, when this person, and especially in the poor cities, when they believe, uh, they are on fire for the Lord. Five, five o'clock prayer meeting, and I'm still getting up, and they're already praying. Um, it was a great experience. They do things differently, though. Communion, one cup, everybody, you know, just twist it a little, and then pretty soon you got someone's lipstick on your lip. I mean, but, you know, there's some things that I had to adapt to. I had to adapt to their culture. You know, I could say, you know, don't you understand? You're supposed to use the little cups with loaves of grace, you know? In there somewhere. <laughs> Revelation chapter 23, maybe? I don't know. You'll find it. Just look. 
I can't do that. If, it's, if there's freedom, so we can do things a little different, right? But some things are scripture, and one thing that we realized when I got there was one of the problems with the churches is leadership. And most of the people that go to church in China is the women, not 80% women. And so a lot of times the wives will be up there pastoring, and they'll just be like, you know, in the back, like these two guys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they'll be, I mean, the, you know, the, the, it's, it's a problem in the, ch in the churches. And, you know, I would go to the leadership and say, well, what does the Bible say? You know, the, the men need to be trained for leadership. And they need to learn to love their wives, to lead their wives, to lead their families, and to lead in the church. And they didn't like that. And they would say, you know, don't bring your culture here. But, you know, the Bible wouldn't let me have that opinion. That was the scripture. Right. And they would say, well, the men don't want to. We just, we don't train them. I mean, can you imagine if we had that attitude with our military? Ah, they don't want to be trained. Either. Or law enforcement. I mean, those men, when they go in there, they may be couch potatoes before they go in, but when they come out, they are ready for war. They are men ready for battle. Why is that different in the spiritual realm? Why? I mean, there's a war of greater con consequence, of eternal consequence. There is a, a leader of far greater authority. Why are we not training the man as the scripture says that we should? And so that is a need that we see that, that we can do when we go to China is to train up men to lead. And there is such a great need in China. I mean, you know, some people say 5% Christian in China, but I don't believe that. Uh, the CIA website says 5%, but I don't think they distinguish between true gospel and false gospel. They include everybody in there. They got, they got works-based salvation. They got cults in there. And we know that not everybody that comes in the doors of a church that preaches the gospel is truly born again. So that number goes far, far lower. And so there is a need in China. And God has given Lily and I a door uh, that we can go and he's provided training at the training center and through our mission board and we are just excited to go and Lord willing that's what we're going to do. And so we're asking that you consider supporting us uh, to go there and do that. But I want to, uh, the few minutes that I have left, I want to just to look at this scripture. This scripture should be the a motivation for missions. When John, he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. First, I want you to consider the person who speaks this message. The person who speaks this message makes a difference. You know, when I was a young boy, my brother might say to me, Andy, go clean your room. You know what I'd do? I'd put these two fingers together, put it up to his nose, and go, and I'd say, who are you to tell me what to do? I'm not going to do that. But maybe, maybe he would say, well, Dad said... <laughs> okay, that's different, right? The authority of the person who speaks makes a difference. What does it say in John chapter 1, verse 6? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is God's man speaking. This is God's emissary. This is God's messenger, delivery boy. He's got God's message. He says, here it is. He's, this is the Lord's forerunner. He says, behold. Everybody look. I'm the one God sent to tell you something. Don't tell me God doesn't speak. He speaks. Amen. And he even came into this world. He doesn't just speak from afar. He doesn't just say, hey, down there. He came down into this world. And he sent his man to tell us, to prepare us. That's the man. John would be a good study, by the way. John got a great compliment. Jesus said, there was no greater prophet than John. Of, of men born of women, he's the greatest. I mean, that's a pretty big compliment. The Lord, of, the Lord of heaven gives you that compliment. We better look at this guy. Right? We can understand some things. A faithful prophet. A faithful messenger. This is, this is the guy. What does John do? What do we see about John? He's saying, there he is. Go to him. Look to him. Right? And when people start going to him, there's joy in their heart. Right? That's a faithful servant. Pointing people to Jesus. Are you pointing people to Jesus? There's other things we can look, but for time's sake, let's look at the second thing. The reason, the motivation for missions is in this proclamation we have 
the picture of the person that it's pointing to. The Lamb of God. Now to us as Americans, if, we're, if we grew up in church, we can understand this. But the Jews understood this much more. The Lamb. The sacrificial Lamb. Right? I mean, even at the very beginning in, in Genesis, we saw the Lamb. Right? There was two brothers. There was Cain. There was Abel. What, is, what does Cain do? Cain says, God, I'm going to worship you. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to worship you, but I'm going to do it in my own way. I'm going to do it in a convenient way. So he goes back to his veggies and gets some carrots, cucumbers. He says, God, here they are. There's my offering to you. I'm going to worship you with my things. And what does God say? Oh, you're, you're sincere. Oh, you know, you're trying hard. Is that what he says? He's rejected, right? God rejects his offering. And then there's Abel. What does Abel do? Abel says, God, this is what you want. Okay, I'm going to offer that. And I don't think Abel understood fully what he was doing, right? He didn't have the New Testament. He didn't have that proclamation that John made. But he, by faith, that's important, by the way. No, no person is, is saved by their works. Not even I mean, his, his actions show that he believed God. And he offered that lamb. Right? He goes to God with, with, with the, the, the fat of the lamb, or what is, I didn't know exactly how it said it in the scripture, but he offers the lamb. And God says what? He says, that's what I want. Right? And it wasn't the thing itself, but it was what the thing represented. It was the picture that was, that was represented. Right? Yes. God says, that's, that is the thing that can forgive your sin. And God was looking to the future, smelling the savor of the sacrifice, his son dying on the cross. That is what can forgive the sin, right? Amen. I tell you what, the offering of Cain is still being offered today. And I, I dare say it's true, but the offering of Cain may even be offered here tonight. People going to God with their own things. I mean, that Cain was a religious man. He was going to God, but he was saying, God, I'm going to offer you my things. But he was rejected. Abel says, this is what you want. This is the thing that can forgive my sin, that can bring me to you. The Lamb. Only offering up Jesus. Only by him can I go to God. Amen. So where is the, the weight of your hope? Where's the full weight of your hope? Is it one foot on the Lord Jesus and one foot on your works? That's going to fall. Or is the full weight of your hope upon the Lamb and say, I have nothing of my own, only Him. Right. Now we fast forward to John. There's more in the Bible there, some cool things, but I don't have time to talk about it. Let's fast forward to John. What does John do? This is an amazing moment. John says, hey, look at me. Behold the Lamb. The Lamb. So what is John doing? He's transitioning here from picture to person. The picture that everybody's been looking at, all of a sudden, shift your eyes towards the real thing. You know, if my wife didn't come today, what would I do? I'd pull out this picture. Could I just turn that on? I'd pull out a picture and say, here, check out my wife. Right? But if she walked in the room, what would I do? I don't need that anymore. The picture is done. The person is here. They behold my wife. Right? What if I pushed her aside and said, get out of the way, I'm showing them you. <laughs> right? So when Jesus steps on the scene, John says, all right, it's over. The picture's done. No more need for the animal. Here he is. Behold, and look upon him and believe and be saved. And that is the same proclamation that we make today. Behold and look unto him. There it is, the, the person, the picture of the person which is being proclaimed. And then there's the provision, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. There it is, the solution, right? I mean, the world is trying to get rid of the, the problem. The world knows there's a problem. I had a guy tell me, I don't believe in God because if God is so good, the world is, and the world is so bad. That's what he said. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? I thought, that's an amazing statement. You've confessed. You understand goodness, and you understand evil. He, he thought he was an atheist, but he's not. He understands. There's a goodness, there's an evil. 
But you know what he does? He walks away and says, if I can't understand it, I give up. I'm not going to believe. But you know what? That's not what the believer does. We all have those dilemmas in our life. God, you know all things. You're good. How could this happen to me? There's a dilemma. But you know what? The right response is, God, your character is enough. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to, there's a, I don't understand the dilemma here, but I'm going to put faith in you. And you know what? When you do that, the cross is the solution. Right. We see that we see the problem of man. We see the ultimate righteousness of God, the punishment for sin, and it finds its solution in Jesus, the Lamb of God. The world's trying to get rid of the problem. Yeah, psychology, philosophy. I mean, that's just, I took a philosophy class, and that was confusing. We got done with that, and I was like, what in the world? This solved nothing. Psychology is even worse. It's like the deceitful heart. Yeah, I'm going to ask my deceitful heart, what's the problem? You know, it's like asking the fruit seller in China, the fruit lady, is the fruit good? Always says yes. Always. My heart always says good. Great. No problem. My heart always tells me I'm better than you. My driving, I'm driving the car. You make a mistake, you boop, boop, boop. But if I do it, it's no problem. I mean, my heart is, always gives me a good report. I need, I can't trust my heart. I need an outside source. I need that other old lady that comes by, grabs the fruit, and bites it, and says, that's terrible. And then goes and buys another one. I need that. You know what? We need an outside source. We need an honest source. We need a source that knows all things. Do we have that? I think we do. Right here. The Word of God. I mean... He is faithful and true. That's his word, by the way. Faithful and true. His word tells us the problem with man. So I look to the word and it says, it's sin in the heart. And the solution is the one who takes away our sin, which is Christ. The proportion, and then we'll, we'll end here, is the world. The proportion is the world. And the last of all is the proclamation. Someday everybody's going to behold him. They're going to hide in the rocks. They're not going to want to see him. But today they can look upon him and believe. They can behold the Lamb. And that is our job. John didn't finish the job. That was given to the church. And that's mission. To go out and proclaim, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Thank you so much. Okay, Brother Stephen, we're going to have you come at this time and share with us and you know, introduce your wife. And I think you may have a video also. God bless you. And it's a great thing to be here. We're excited to be here. We appreciate you all having us. We are Stephen and Leslie Carrier, carriers of the gospel to Chile. And so we're excited to be going there. You know, one day can change a person's life forever. And in this video that they're getting ready to bring up here and show you all, there was a group of men whose lives were changed forever one day. And after this video, I want to come back and I want to explain to you all a little bit about Chile and how we ended up there. And then go into in 2010, the world watched as a group of 33 men were rescued from the depths of a collapsed mine in Chile. After two weeks of being entrapped, those miners were given hope when a searching camera probe found them still alive. Their rescue was a miracle, and it showed the resilience and strength of a whole nation of people. But the citizens of Chile are facing a greater darkness than those miners faced, a spiritual darkness, one that threatens to destroy their very souls. And who is looking for them? That is why we must go. Just as the people on the surface banded together to reach those miners, so must we come together to reach Chile with the gospel. Together, I believe God will enable us to see his amazing power on display in Chile. Together, I believe the lives of men, women, boys, and girls will be changed by the power of the gospel. Together, I believe we can see Chilean men trained to plant other churches themselves. Together, I believe we can multiply ourselves until not one soul in Chile has not heard of the saving power of Christ. Together, I believe that through Chile, we can reach the world. Will you join me?
women being rescued from the mines. Did anybody actually get to see that? Yes, and it was an exciting thing, wasn't it? Because every time one of them came to the surface, they would do their Chilean cheer. And in Chile, when you do something exciting, like score goal in soccer or whatever, they do the cheer that they do in Chile. So they say the first three letters of Chile's name and the last two letters of Chile's name, and they say, long live Chile. So every time one of them came to the surface, they would say, chi, 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 le, 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 viva Chile. And they'd all cheer, and I wanted to cheer with them because I thought it was awesome. You know, I was watching it there. And, but you know what, to be truthful, I didn't think I would have any connection to this country beyond what I was seeing there on the television. It was 2010, and I was a freshman at my local university, East Tennessee State University, where I was going to college as a freshman, uh, going into broadcasting. I was actually hoping to use broadcasting as a way to get into local politics, and then to keep working my way up and working my way up, and one day I was going to be president of the United States. That was my grand dream. I was so excited about it. I had read the books. I had seen Mr. Smith goes to Washington, and I was ready to go. But about a year later, God began to get a hold of my heart about something. He began to get a hold of my heart about my relationship with him. You see, I was born into a Christian home, but that doesn't make anybody a Christian. But I did accept Christ as my Savior as a, as a young boy after family devotions one night and grew up and just became sort of a lukewarm Christian. Not, not a bad person by any means, but just not somebody who was really living in the victory Christ wanted me to live in. And I had an aunt when I was a little boy who was 21 years old, and she was in a car accident from a drunk driver, and she was killed there, and she was a good Christian young lady. And I remember being about 20 years old in, in 2011 and thinking, Stephen, if you were Aunt Misty, you would have one year left to do something with your life that matters for eternity. And what have you done? And when I looked at my life, to be honest with you, I had all these dreams and plans for myself, but there was nothing of real eternal value there. There was nothing that if I were to be taken out in the same way that she was, there was nothing there that would really have much of an impact at all. And I just thought, that's not how I want to, to live and to die. I would see people in their 80s and 90s who loved God, and I thought, man, that's awesome. I want to be that someday, you know? And God said, well, you're not going to be anything then that you're not being today, you know? People don't become 80 and 90 years old that just love the Lord and know the scriptures, and it just happened overnight. It's a lifetime. And I thought, Jesus, I just want to know you. And, you know, I believe each and every single one of us can be as close to God as we want to be. Amen. I just began to read my Bible and, and to pray. And, and my pastor, he'd always talk about witnessing. And to be truthful with you, I found that in the Bible, too, you know. And so I said, well, guess I ought to do that. And uh, so as the Lord would open up opportunities on my campus there, I witnessed and just loved it, you know. And the closer I got to God, the further and further I got from the dreams I had for myself. And the closer I got to the dreams and the plans Amen. that he had for me. And I just knew he was calling me to serve him full time. I knew that I could become president and do all these great things. But the very next person could come after me and change everything that I did. But anything that you or I do for eternity can never be undone and can never be changed. And to me, that was a life that I said, that's a life that matters. And I couldn't get away from it. I would read my Bible and I just could not get away from it. And more and more, like, um, like my friend Andy was saying, you know, more and more dissatisfied with the direction I was in. And more and more, I was like, Jesus, I just want to serve you. So I surrendered my life to him and went to Bible college there in, in Knoxville. And then I graduated there. And God gave me such a love for Spanish-speaking people. And I got to live in Texas for a year and all kinds of things. And then I came back to our home church uh, in, in Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church there in Gray, Tennessee. And, and I was helping start a Spanish ministry there. And some people got saved. And it was exciting. But my heart was to be a missionary, you know. Well, about a year later, the door opened up because I was praying, like, God, where do you want me? I didn't want to just make a decision for whatever reason. I really wanted God to lead me and to guide me. And he answered that prayer just like he was talking about, you know. And so I, I, the door opened up in 2017 for us to go on a short-term mission trip to Chile and through my church. And at this time, I was unmarried, and they asked if I was wanting to go as a chaperone. You know, because I spoke some Spanish, I was like 24 years old, and I, the, you know, 18-year-olds are calling me Mr. Steven. You know, it's kind of weird, but I was like, okay, whatever. You know, so I went, and I never really wanted to go to Chile as a missionary, to be truthful with you. Now, I knew I was going to go to a Spanish-speaking country, but I'll be honest, I had two reasons I did not want to go to Chile. The first was, if you look at Chile on a map of South America, and you can, if you get one of our prayer cards off the table there, and also if you want to sign up for our email updates, we'd love to um, get you on that list as well, but... If you look at Chile on a map of South America, it's kind of just this string that just hangs down the side of the continent there on South America. 
on the west side of the continent. And I thought to myself, well, if I go to a church like this one, I mean, I want to give them a country. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I want to give them the billions untold. You know, I was like, who wants to get up and present a string? You know, and so I was like, I don't want to go to Chile. But then it turns out that there's almost 7 million people um, in their capital city and then a million more on the coast and millions more throughout. So, it, you know, I think we'll be busy for a while. But also, it turns out that if a person dies or doesn't know Christ as their Savior, it doesn't matter what their country looks like and how many people were there. What matters is they'll go to hell regardless. But the second reason was I heard that they speak poor Spanish in Chile. By this time, I spoke a large level of Spanish. And I, I thought to myself, I was, I was like, why do I want to go to that country when I can go to any other country and do just fine, you know? So I was like, I don't want to go there. But I got to go back for six months as a missionary intern there with, with Brother Jason Holt, that same missionary we had gone the first time. And it was while I was there that I began to realize something. I began to realize that their bad Spanish is not really bad Spanish. Their poor Spanish is poor Spanish, like what we in the South supposedly speak, poor English, you know? I mean, I'm from Tennessee, my wife's from Georgia, y'all from South Carolina, most of you, and we know that y'all is a word, and, and ain't is a word, and you can say any bad thing about somebody as long as you say, bless their heart, right? I can say it. And my friend John Moncada there in Chile, his name was John Peter, and he said, Stephen, in Chile we have this word, pull, P-O, that we say at the end of a lot of our words. So instead of see, a lot of times we'll say see, for, you know, no, we'll say no, for the different things. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what does it mean? And he said, it doesn't have a meaning. And he wagged his finger at me, kind of. And they do that. They'll wag their finger when they say no sometimes. And it's not rude there. It's just what they do. Unfortunately, I picked it up and came back to America wagging my finger at people. And I had to drop that habit a little bit. But he said, in Chile we have this word pull. And I, I was like, okay. And he said, it doesn't really have a meaning. And I thought to myself, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. How do you have a word that has no meaning, you know? And so I thought to myself, didn't tell him, but I said, I'm not going to say this word because if I go to another country, I don't want this bad habit in my life, you know? And so I was like, no, I'm not going to say that. And like two weeks later, I was talking to somebody. And I was like, see, Paul? And I was like, oh, no, Paul. You know, and like all these poles just began to come out of my mouth, one after the other. And by the time I left, one of them was like, oh, he abuses the pole. I was like, yeah, I, I, do, I do a little bit, you know. And they have another word. It's fome, F-O-M-E. And it means boring. And so you can be like, oh, this missionary is fome, you know, which I hope you will not say about me tonight. But, you know, be like whatever, a movie or whatever it may be, fome. And I just loved it, the way they sang when they talked. And everything was so great. And God just began to give me such a love for the language of Chile itself, but also the people of Chile. I got to go to several different countries, actually, in South America while I was there. But Chile was just the one. That God just knit my heart with the people there. I mean, they were sweet. And they would take you in like family and treat you, treat you so kindly and different things, especially once you got to know them. But the sad thing about Chile is, um, unlike China, many people in Chile have heard of the name of Jesus. I mean, you'll see the symbolism throughout Chile. But the Jesus that they know there in Chile is a Jesus who always needs help in some type of way. It's a Jesus who's always hanging on the cross, or he's always lying in his mother's arms, needing, needing them to help him. Like, he can kind of save them, but he needs their good works to go along with it. He can kind of save them, but they had to get that baptism when they were born. You know, that sort of thing. Their religion is a very works-based religion. Amen. And as Andy said, th there is nobody who is saved by works. We are saved by grace through Amen. faith. And, and that is the, the Jesus that Leslie and I know, and that you and I, I hope every one of us here know, is a Jesus who is risen again and who is able to save them from their sins and without their help. And that is the Jesus that we want to go tell them about. That is the Jesus that we want to go show them the Bible and open the scriptures and say, you don't need all this other stuff. The, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And that's what we want to do. And Well, I came back to, to uh, America six months later and I got, went to Vision, where our mission board is as well. We're with the same mission board. And went there and wanted to go with that mission board. And it was while I was there that, that I met this beautiful young lady sitting on the front row. Leslie Pike was her name at the time. And we just really hit it off. And she practically asked me out to lunch one day. So I said, sure, why not? And so we went. And, and, and she said, Stephen, I would go anywhere my husband wants to go. She was training to be a missionary. And she said, but if I could choose, I would go somewhere in Central or South America, because I've been to Panama and Costa Rica, and she said, I just love the culture, you know, I love everything about it, and I said, well, I've got the 
perfect country for you. And so we, uh, we got married this past year, and we've just been really, really enjoying going around and meeting our brothers and sisters. And we are praying that God will allow us to go to, to Chile and to, to plant churches and to train men to take over those churches, as he was talking about, and multiplying ourselves in that way. Amen. And I pray and I believe, you know, that God will use us and can use us. But you know what? I believe God can use each and every single person Amen. sitting in this room. Amen. I don't believe I've looked into the face of a person tonight that God doesn't want to use in some great and some awesome way for his glory. But how will God use us? In Matthew 16 and verse 24, the Bible says, I'll give you all a second to get there. Bible says in Matthew 16, 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And Jesus tells us here about a couple of types of loss, but the first one mentioned is that Christian who loses their life for Christ's sake. And now let's face it, right here in South Carolina, most likely none of us are going to be called upon to literally die for the gospel's sake unless something goes terribly wrong in the next few years. But every single one of us sitting in this room tonight that call ourselves by the name of Christ are called to be all in the battle for him. Every single one of us here tonight are called to be not in that lukewarm state, but in that state that says, I'm taking up my cross, and I am following after Amen. Jesus. When I think of somebody who did just that, I think of the Apostle Paul. And what did the Apostle Paul say in, in Philippians chapter 3? He said in Philippians 3, 7, he said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. And he says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And he said, Why? That I may know him, Amen. and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And Paul said, I want to take up my cross and follow Christ. I want to know Jesus Christ so much that I do not care what it costs Amen. me. And we, Christian, must decide. I want to know Jesus Christ so much and serve him so much that I do not care what it costs me. And it will cost us something. It will cost us what this world has to offer. I mean, there's, there's no doubt in my mind there are many people in here who could have so much of what the world has to offer if they wanted it. But what this world has to offer is junk anyway. I mean, the things that people were fighting over 10 and 15 years ago, they're selling down there in a yard sale somewhere this coming week. Things depreciate so quickly here in America and in time. It will cost us perhaps the opinions of the people, of our friends perhaps, or, or of other people. But what do those opinions matter and what will those opinions matter in 100 years from now? We'll all be dead. It may cost us the fame that we want for ourselves, but let's face it, what's fame anyway? A person gets famous, that what, what do they get ultimately? They die and they trend for a few hours on Twitter and then they're gone forever and the world forgets about them. The world does not care as far as that goes. But I tell you what, the treasures that are eternal, the treasures that you and I lay up in heaven, those are treasures that can never fade away, can never, can never rust or can never corrupt, and that is the treasure that Christ wants us to seek after and to be laying up. And I tell you what, we must all be in that battle for him. Amen. When this church comes together, it comes together as a body of believers and as a team. Right. And isn't it awesome when a team comes together and it's like, hey, I'm giving my all for Jesus Christ. And everybody says, hey, I'm giving my all for Jesus Christ. And, and they're going forward. And how, how do you think the church has, has seen God's blessings as it has because a group of people say, hey, we're going forward all the way. And you say, well, can, you, you say, you know what, well, I can't do you know, and I can't preach or whatever it may be, but I tell you what, God has given every one of us something that we can do here in this church. God's given each of us a way we can serve in our local church and be all in that battle for him. Yeah. And there's not a one of us who can't write an encouraging note to somebody and say, hey, I'm praying for you and thinking about you today. And there's not a one of us that can't do that. There's not a one of us that can't be a part of us, can be an encourager. At, at the least, I don't think that's the least, I think that's a wonderful gift to have. 
But whenever you decide and say, hey, I want to take up my cross and follow after Jesus, and you know, maybe, maybe pastor has stood up here and he said, hey, we need workers in this ministry, or we need helpers in that ministry, or whatever it may be, and maybe you have thought, man, I can do that. God, you've equipped me to do that. Can I do that? But immediately, when you want to do that kind of thing, what he was talking about earlier, that fear tries to come in, doesn't it? You say, well, I want to serve God, but what about this? I want to follow after Christ, but what will that person think at this? And we have this fear, but I think we must have the attitude when the 12 spies that went to the land of Canaan came back, 10 of them said, we have all the promises of God, but there are giants in the land. Yeah. I know what God told me, but I'm looking at what I can see, and unfortunately, sadly, so many of us do just that. We say, I know Jesus told me he'd never leave me or forsake me, but what if he lets me fall flat on my face right here? Well, I believe we must have the attitude of Caleb when he said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. And Christian, I believe that when you say, I'm going to serve Jesus, and you take that first step of faith, I believe he helps you to take the next one and the next one and yeah. the next one Amen. and the next one. So you end up all the way over here having no idea how you got there. But you know Jesus led you all the way. Amen. And that's the, that's the most precious and wonderful and important life. And sometimes, Christian, those fears that we have anyway are unfounded and ridiculous to begin with. Things that are never going to happen. When I was a little boy, we used to go to Maryland every year. I had a great grandmother who lived up there, so we'd go see Grandma and all the aunts and uncles. And it was the boringest trip ever, but we'd go. And so there we went. You know, when you're little, seven hours seems like forever to drive. You know, now in deputation, we're like, well, that's not so bad, you know? So, but anyway, we go up there, and one night we were sitting in her living room. And she had on her TV, it was always on, but this night in particular, she had on America's Most Wanted. When I was a little boy, I used to think these killers were everywhere. I mean, I used to think kidnappers and murderers were out there waiting for me the moment I got out my door. And if I didn't get in safely to where mom and dad were, I was going to get one of those, you know? And so I was always afraid, and this show was talking about people who were still on the loose. And there was this man who had killed his wife and his daughter. And I thought to myself how terrible that was. I, it never occurred to me as a seven-year-old boy that a man could do that to his own family, you know? And I was like, I thought, man, I hope that man isn't anywhere near here. I was like, no, we're in Baltimore, Maryland. I mean, come on, you know? How safe can you get? But then I began to rationalize. I thought, he's not near here. But then I began to think, now, wait a minute. Now, if that man could do that to his family, then my parents could do the exact same thing to me. And I just became deathly afraid of my parents. And I was like, these murderers. I mean, who are these people? I was scared of them. We drove home to Tennessee. I slept home, slept with one eye open the whole way. And we get home and I'm terrified. And for a few days, this fear is just building that my parents are going to kill me. And you know how when you're scared of something, just you become almost physically ill if you're worried about something after a few days. And that's no way that God wants us to live as Christians. He said, I'm not giving you the spirit of fear. I'm giving you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. But you can forgive a little boy who thinks he's living with his would-be killers. And there I was one night, and I thought this was the end. And they called me into their room, and I said, Do you? They said, what's wrong with you? And I was like, do you know that show we watched the other night? They said, yeah, I'm just afraid. Y'all are going to kill me. And they were like, we're not going to kill you. We love you, you know, and all this. And I thought, that's what I would say, too, if I were going to do it and didn't want them to know. <laughs> but as a little boy, that was a real fear that I had of happening. And it was never going to happen. It's ridiculous. My parents knew it wasn't going to happen. But I think, how much more does our Heavenly Father know when we say, Jesus, I want to serve you, but I'm afraid of whatever may happen? Yeah. How much more does he say, I did not bring you here to get a big laugh out of it, to watch you fall on your face. I brought you here because I want to use you, and I want to glorify my name Amen. through you. And I tell you what, if, you will, if you'll say, Jesus, I will take up my cross and follow after you, he will use you in some way. God will use each and every single person who says, I want to be like that, and I don't want to be like Demas. Demas, who Paul said, love this present world. What a sad thing for any Christian, to, for it to be said of any Christian, he or she loved this present world. But the second loss mentioned is the loss of the soul. In that, in that passage there, Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's the worst loss of all, because unlike any other loss, that loss is never over. That person who woke up in China and went to hell today, having never heard the name of Jesus Christ, that loss has only just begun for that person. I mean, I think of poor Lily here, if that friend had not come to her and had not said, I want you to tell you about Jesus and things, where would she be today? But that loss is never over. 
when we were in Chile the first time, we, a missionary there took us to a Catholic graveyard. And the priests had come and they had blessed the ground there. And if you would pay and get your loved one buried there, it was better for them in the afterlife. And we know that's nowhere in the scriptures. I mean, you can't find that anywhere. We're there surrounded by these graves. And if these people trusted in anything but the blood of Jesus Christ to save them from their sins, they died and went to hell. And when, as we were standing there, the missionary that was there with us, Brother Holt, he turned in his Bible and he began to read in Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. We know the story. They both die. But the Bible says in verse 23 of the rich man, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham says, we can't do that. And then the rich man says in verse 27, I, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. He says, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And as we stood there surrounded by these graves, Brother Holt said, these graves are full of people crying out for somebody in this auditorium to go tell their loved one not to come to this place of torment. And that broke my heart for the people in, in Chile there. But you know what? That's not just in Chile. That is right here where we are right now. There are graves of people around us tonight crying out for somebody in this auditorium to go tell their loved one not to come to this place of torment. And maybe God's been putting it in your heart to witness to a co-worker, to witness to a family member, to witness to a neighbor, whatever it may be. And I urge you, before, before it is too late to go to that person, and don't make excuses and don't say, God, I'm scared. Because let's face it, we're going to get scared to witness some. But I believe when we go and start doing it, God just gives us the words and helps us through it. The Holy Spirit does. They say, because you do not know that this time next week that God's been working in your heart about witnessing to somebody, he's trying to give that person another opportunity. Because he knows this time next week that opportunity is gone forever. Don't take, don't take for granted that the person will always be there. I found out just this year about a coworker my age who died. And that opportunity, if anybody ever wanted to get into witness to her, is no longer there ever, ever again. And I trust that everybody's here safe. I, I never want to assume that. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's the most important thing. Nothing he said, nothing I said matters if you don't know Christ as your Savior. Knowing that Jesus Christ, God's Son, came to earth and lived a sinless life and took your sin and my sin on him and died on the cross and shed his blood and rose again the third day. The Bible says that if we will call on the name of the Lord, he will save us. Amen. But I believe I'm speaking to a majority of Christians. And so I ask, Christian, what type of Christian are you? Are you the type of Christian who says, I'm not perfect, but the best I know, I'm following after Christ, taking up my cross and following him. Amen. Or do you say, you know what, there is something in my heart. It may be anything. That I am holding back from God. That I'm saying, Jesus, you can have everything but this. Jesus, you can use me in any way but this. <laughs> Jesus, everything but. I urge you to give whatever that thing is to Jesus Christ. Because you can do so much more than you can imagine doing with it yourself. But I say, along with Joshua, you know, the, the Bible says that no man can serve two masters, for he will love the one and hate the other, or always the one and despise the other. And so I say, along with Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Take the stand if you would, please. Rachel, would you come to the piano, please? <coughs> I appreciate both of these missionaries. I appreciate both of their messages tonight. The gospel has been shared. Lord done a great work here on Sunday night and uh, saved some folks that have been in church for a while. And I praise God for it. They still could be some here tonight. Brother Stephen just stated that they have something in their life between them and the Lord and what they should be doing. <coughs> Heads bowed and eyes closed, and Miss Rachel plays a little something on the piano. If God spoke to your heart tonight about anything, you need to come. The altar's open. They could even be one here tonight that's not saved. You could have never trusted Christ or had a personal relationship with Him. If you're here tonight and never done that, you can come tonight and know for sure and get saved. I want to take the Bible and show you. And it wasn't even to come for any reason. He's still about to come. God had you tonight here by divine appointment. I believe that every one of us are here tonight by divine appointment.
God for the message that encourages and challenges our heart. And I appreciate the call upon the lives of these two missionaries. I appreciate the work that they're going into. As I said, it's not just in Chile. It's not just in other countries. But it's right here at home, too. There's people that need the Lord. Anyone needs it now. Well, I appreciate you coming tonight. Appreciate the privilege we had to meet these two families. It's been a real blessing. I appreciate their friendliness. I appreciate their excitement and enthusiasm. Uh, boy, we ought to be excited about when we're doing something for Jesus. We ought to be honored and privileged to do something for him. We don't need to lose our excitement and our enthusiasm. So you be sure to go by their tables. They both have tables set up out in the lobby. Be sure to go by and look at them. If you have any questions, I'm sure they would answer those if they can. So if uh, you need to, stay a little while, talk to them, pick up a prayer card, let them know you'd be praying for them, and Lord, direct us what he'd have us to do as far as these two missionaries and their wives as they go on the farm field. Let me mention, in the morning, I uh, mentioned this past Sunday that we would uh, be here at 8 o'clock in the morning for those going to breakfast with the veterans. Uh, we're going to move that up to 7.30 uh, because we have a daughter-in-law that's going to have surgery at 11 o'clock. And then Brother Russell has an appointment he has to get back to. So we're going to be here at uh, 7.30 to leave from the church, those that want to go. And if you drive up to Strawberry Hill, our reservations are for 8.30. So uh, if you drive on up there, we'll be there about 8.30 or so. Okay? All right, just make sure everybody knew that. And if you can't go and you decided not to go, be sure to let us know that also, okay? All right, well, it's good to be here tonight, Brother Stephen and Brother Andy. If y'all want to go ahead and dismiss and go out to your tables, and we'll be there when the folks come out. And they come out and spend a little time with you or talk with you. Hey, Amen. Don't forget Sunday, sir. Don't forget yeah. Sunday school. Try to be here for Sunday school. Try to yeah. bring somebody with you, invite somebody. And be praying. Be praying for the request that we're mentioning tonight. The Lord be doing according to his will. Amen. Brother Martin, uh, fatigue, would you dismiss us, please? God, and precious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this privilege of being in our house. Father, we thank you for these two young people here, Lord. I just pray that you will all fill them with the Holy Spirit and use them in a mighty yes. way in the country. We can say that. Father, we say that we love you. We thank you for the many blessings that you bestow on Mary and Mary Church in this season. Father, Thank you for the souls that were saved on 